So this is really in this slide here, the core idea of, of what we call robot web, which is how we can use this for multi robot uh, localization. So what we do is we think about the full factor graph for a multi robot problem. So here we're assuming in this little example, we've got three robots, green, blue, and, and red. Each one of those has been moving through the world. So we've got uh, for each of these six different time steps shown. So these uh, big circles are, are pose variables for each of these robots at particular points in time. We assume that we have two types of measurements here. We have odometry measurements. So these are these black uh, factors here that join consecutive poses. So the robot might have wheel odometry. It might have an inertial sensor or something estimating its relative motion. And then the robots make measurements of, of each other. So these factors that join poses from different robots are into robot <coughs> measurements. So those might be robot one measuring robot two, or they might be robot two measuring robot one. And in fact, we differentiate between those two things. So the red factors here are the factors that robot two has made. The green factors are the factors that robot one has made. So that's just the full factor graph. You could define that factor graph. You could upload it to a, a server. You could solve it with whatever factor graph solver that you want. We want to solve it in a distributed way between all of these devices with message passing. So the simple thing that we do is we basically draw a dotted line around uh, the parts of the factor graph that each of the robots owns. So basically robot one owns all of its pose variables, all of its odometry variables, and then it owns the factors relating to its own sensors and measurements that it has made. So these are the measurements from robot one's sensors. And robot two owns all of the measurements that it has made with its sensors and all of its pose variables. So when we do message passing around this graph, all of the message passing within one robot's dotted line is no problem. You know, that's just done on that uh, robot's own processor. But then the messages that it needs to send between uh, across to another robot, we have a kind of web-like interface for that. So be that because of this fantastic property that, that you know, optimization in GBP can be asynchronous, it doesn't really matter what order you send the messages in. Uh, as shown by that kind of random clicking I, I was doing earlier, all that we have to do is each robot looks at its dotted line and, and basically presents all of the latest outgoing messages from all of these. So it will have a latest outgoing message that it needs to send on this line, on this line, on this line, on this line. It just kind of presents all of that information on something like a, a web page. So the robots are now just whenever they can connecting to each other's web pages, reading the latest outgoing messages. So, you know, robot two will connect to robot one's web page and it will say, are there any new messages for me? And so, yeah, if, if, it's, if robot one has done some updates, there should be a new message on this edge, on this edge and on this edge that are of interest to robot two. So it just needs to, co to copy those across. So this is just a little visualization of what that web page uh, might look like. So there's a list of, you know, these, these are the, the factors and variables that have, for which I have a new message for you. And these are small things, these, these messages. So a typical message in GBP is, is like a small matrix. So something like a, you know, a three by three, or you know, it depends on the dimensionality of the problem. But these are small matrices. So they just need to download a small kind of table of numbers from each other. So via this ad hoc uh, communication, the, the whole thing can can converge. And, and I think for me in the design of this, this is, this is really important because we're interested in scalability here. We would eventually like this to run for, you know, hundreds or thousands of devices. So all communication between the devices is via this simple web-like uh, protocol. They don't really need to know anything about each other. They don't need to, you know, robot two doesn't need to know how robot one sensors work, for instance, because the sensor model is held, you know, within robot one, the details of this factor are all held within robot one. So it's this very, very sort of simple and I think very uh, scalable API like uh, in interface. Um, yeah, uh, so the, the, there's, a, there's something that does make it somewhat more, more complicated, but again, we think there's, there's a good, good solution. So when we have variables that represent things like rotations, so um, something like a 2D or a 3D rotation, which we represent with groups of, you know, SE2 and, and SE3 
mutation matrices and that kind of thing. We do need to do that properly here. So we, we've uh, come up with a way of, of dealing with over-parameterized variables, which uses Lie group theory. And, and the basic idea is that every message that involves a, 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 a Lie group variable, you send the whole kind of group element, and then you send a precision matrix in the tangent space of, of that group element. So again, you're sending small messages, messages around, but you have to be careful about, uh, about how you use them. So this picture is from an excellent tu tutorial on, on Lie groups, which we spent a lot of time uh, reading recently from, from Joanne uh, Solar et al., et al., which I highly recommend. Um, yeah, so, so let's go back to this uh, demo then, and I'll, I'll show you some of the things that this can do. And I should say that this, this demo is, is largely thanks to, to Riku Morai, who's here today, who's a PhD uh, student working in our, uh, in our group. And we'll, we will be publishing a paper about this, uh, hopefully very soon. Uh, let me just go back and show you this. Okay, so there are several aspects I can show you in this demo. Let's do, do this one uh, first. Uh, so here we've got a, a scenario where there's, I think about 30 uh, robots here. Um, and they're all trying to follow circular paths of, of different radius. So I should say that the, you know, the, the planning here is just something very, very simple. So we're talking here about estimation and the robots knowing where they are. If they know where they are, then we can tell them to follow a, a known path. So each of them is trying to follow a circle, which works if it knows where it is, but doesn't work if it doesn't know uh, where, where it is. So let's first just, uh, just run this. Um, so if I just start running this, the robots are all starting to move in, in, in circles and the red lines are showing the measurements uh, between them. So I'm just gonna make a couple of changes here. First of all, there are some things I can change. So how many iterations of GBP do we do on each movement step of the robots? That's the thing that I'm changing here. This window is, is something that we're doing here. So in this current method to, to avoid the fact graph just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, we're currently keeping a time window. So they, I think this is a problem we need to come back and think about more generally in the future. But we're only retaining states and measurements over some window of time in the past. And the other thing is we have some fixed beacons in the scene here. So we have kind of four fixed landmarks, which the robots know the position of uh, in, in the corners of, of, of the scene here. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of these robots in the center, so there's a limited range of their sensors. They never actually see the landmarks in the corner. They only ever see the other robots. If I turn off this, so turn off the factor display, what you're still seeing is the black lines flashing around. And this is basically the communication pattern. So on every step, each robot at the moment is connecting to one other robot and reading its uh, latest outgoing messages. And it's doing that in a pretty random pattern, which is biased towards reading from robots that are nearby. Uh, if I turn uh, that off, uh, it become a bit cleaner looking. So now we're just seeing the estimated uh, motions of the robots. And remember that for each of these, there's a ground truth robot and an estimated robot. And they're very much overlaid each other. If I just pause this for a second, I can show you here the kind of the, the history to show that all the robots have followed a very nice uh, circular tra trajectory. Uh, so again, for comparison, let's just try for a second turning the sensor off. So if I set this to zero, basically the, the robots will not be using their, their sensors. And you'll see that they're just using odometry now and they will basically gradually uh, drift uh, away. So if I, again, just pa pause for a second and show you this. So the, these are what the kind of trajectories look like when we aren't using uh, this, this GBP and, and sensing. Uh, okay, I'll, let you, I'll show you something a little bit different. So this is another very nice property of, of, of this is it can be very, very dynamic. There's nothing that defines the number of robots in this system in advance, and we can change that dynamically. Uh, so here we're gonna start with just one robot. It's moving around and there are five known landmarks in the scene. So. Uh, we can see these kind of uh, uh, properties here that it will, um, while it's not making any measurements, oh, I wasn't showing the factors. Okay. So here you can see it, you know, 
making measurements of these fixed uh, landmarks when it's close enough to them. Those will constrain its pose quite nicely. When it moves further away from the landmarks, it's not getting any measurements and its pose will, will gradually drift and you'll see it diverge from the ground truth. Now, what we can do is dynamically add more robots in, into the scene. Uh, so if I click drop robot a few times, each time I do this, we're dropping a new robot in the scene. So the place that you see it drop is, is where the robot actually is, but we don't know that in advance. So all the robots are initialized, they're in, and their estimates are initialized basically in, in the center. So it doesn't, know, um, it doesn't know where they are in advance, but they gradually uh, initialize themselves. So you see that these robots, as the moving robot gets close to them and makes observations of them, they eventually get a good enough estimate. So we've, we've set it up so the robots don't start moving until they've got a good estimate of their positions, and then they start moving. And now I think you can really see what we're talking about when we use a word like robot web. We've got, we've got this kind of web of localization, which is highly uh, dynamic. So there's one robot here that's, I think it's only just finally localized itself now. But, you know, whereas the, the original robot, when it moved up into the top left, it really didn't know where it was because it's far from any landmarks. Now, as long as there are some other land, uh, you know, robots nearby, it can have a good estimate even, even when it's right out in that, in that region. So we can drop even, even more in there. So again, let me just show you the kind of extreme robustness of this. So at the moment with this noise percent, so I think that this means a fraction of, of you know, 1% of, of all measurements are complete garbage. So there's Gaussian noise on all measurements, but 1% of measurements are, are complete garbage. If we just set that to something actually quite a lot higher here, let's try for instance, 30%. So this means 30% of measurements are just complete nonsense. But even so, because we're using this robust uh, kernel, we're able to really reject those. So the, blue, the red lines are the su successful measurements that we've kind of accepted. The blue ones are the ones we've rejected because they're far off in the heavy tails of this, uh, of this robust uh, function. So this is very, very robust, even when, we are, uh, even when we've got a lot of garbage uh, measurements. So the last thing I'll show you just towards scalability. So now let's try with, with a with 100 robots here. Let's run this. So clearly it's running slower. You know, we're simulating this on the CPU. So of course, you know, if we are running this properly in, in parallel with all the processing on real robots, it should be much better. But let's just change a couple of things here that should make it faster. So let's do a few, a few less uh, iterations. Let's reduce this window. And then the other thing is probably just reduce the range of the sensor. So rather than uh, rather than 30, let's change that to 10. So now the robots are only making quite local uh, measurements and, and we're getting pretty sort of acceptable uh, speed here. And let's just visualize the graph. So here, you know, now you'll see that the robots are only making these very kind of local observations of other robots. The graph sometimes even becomes sort of temporarily disconnected, but, but you know, none, none of that matters. This is just a completely general algorithm that can cope with all of these different situations. And I, I would say most of the robots are you know, pretty well localized uh, most of the time 